for today. Um, I would just uh, try to think of something new to do every year, five years in a row here. So um, I, I thought I'd do something a, a little completely different. This is my next book project. Uh, essentially, this is volume five of my trilogy uh, <laughs> on, uh, on the subject of uh, evolutionary economics. Just as uh, Richard Dawkins is uh, raising our consciousness about the power of evolution to explain not only life, but but religion and morality as well, and that it's okay to be an atheist. And uh, he basically has stood up and, like uh, the character in uh, Network, uh, said, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And uh, it's okay to just stand up and say it. Well, I want to do something like that in the next book project. That is, I want to raise our consciousness about the power of evolution to explain economics, evolutionary ethics to explain how morals, how markets can be moral a complexity theory to explain how markets rise and, and that it's okay to be a libertarian. <laughs> just, just out of curiosity, how many, how many of you would call yourselves a libertarian? Small L, you don't have to have voted for the party or anything. Wow, incredible. This has to be one of the biggest gatherings I've ever seen of <laughs> libertarians. We have the same problem that atheists have, as Richard said, it's like herding cats, you know, trying to what are we? Well, fiscally conservative, socially liberal, so uh, you can be an equal opportunity critic of Democrats and Republicans, or you can find friends in both camps. Um, I guess the simplest principle behind it is that uh, people should be free to think, believe, and act as they choose as long as they do not fringe, infringe on the equal freedom of others. That's about as basic as it gets, of course. That word infringe then becomes where the rubber meets the road for policy, but that's a different subject. So uh, this is a natural extension of what I've been writing about and why people believe weird things about science and pseudoscience and how we believe about science and religion and the science of good and evil about science and morality and then I got sidelined because of the, uh, of the intelligent design movement but it was a chance to refine my thoughts on evolution and Darwinian thinking and so that's where I'm going now with this whole business of uh, evolutionary economics. The problem, I've, I've been a libertarian my whole life, uh, uh, I mean since I can, it was a teenager I guess and I've noticed not, there's not that many of us, and a lot of people think we're, we're a little strange, and, 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 they, and most people have a hard time with the idea of so much freedom in, in a marketplace. Why is that? Uh, it, when I started applying evolutionary thinking to the process and thinking about folk intuitive notions of things and why people get so many areas of science wrong intuitively, it, makes, it began to make sense to me. Like with folk astronomy, we have an intuitive sense that the world is flat. Celestial bodies revolve around the Earth. That's, what the, that's the way it feels. It seems like that's, that's what it looks like. And the planets are wandering gods who determine our future. <clears throat> folk biology, we have an intuitive sense that there is an elan vital flowing through all living things, which they're, in their functional design were created ex nihilo by a designer. In folk psychology, we have an intuitive sense that mind and brain are separate like there's a little homunculus in there somewhere, a, a ghost in the machine that produces a mind somehow disconnected from the brain. And in folk economics, I think there's a, a similar problem. We have an intuitive sense that excessive wealth is wrong. Usury is a sin. Economic systems must be designed from the top down. You can't just let them run themselves. And, and we misunderstand, we mistrust the invisible hand of the marketplace. Um, the reason folk science so often gets it wrong uh, is it's middle land. Uh, it's hard for us to really grasp things like quantum mechanics. It makes no sense at all because we have no intuitive experience with it in our evolutionary history. Plus, and then you add on to that. We live a scant three score and ten years, <clears throat> far too short a time to witness evolution, continental drift, or long-term environmental changes. <clears throat> I think it's why so many people have a difficult time grasping and getting behind the global warming uh, issue because, well, it was cold yesterday. I mean, the, the intuitive sense I have is it's not getting warmer. Heck, it was cold last week also. And we, 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 we think anecdotally, uh, just very short term. That's the way we were designed, as it were, by evolution uh, to think. And the same problem with causal inference in folk science. It's equally untrustworthy. We cor correctly surmise designed objects such as stone tools to be the product of an intelligent designer and thus naturally assume that all functional objects such as eyes must have been similarly intelligently designed. Likewise, lacking a cogent theory of how neural activity gives rise to consciousness, we imagine mental spirits floating within our heads. Um, when Francis Crick wrote his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, the, 
The only thing that was astonishing to me that anybody would find that astonishing, but in fact, most people do, because it's counterintuitive. Um, and so likewise with folk economics, we evolved in small bands of hunter-gatherers of roughly 150 people. There were no capital markets, there was no economic growth, no accumulation of wealth, no excessive wealth or poverty, very little division of labor other than the obvious, little specialization and concentration of lab la uh, labor, certainly no invisible hand at work, no marketplace like that, anything like what we think of today. Cargo cult economics, or the whole concept of the cargo cult, where does cargo come from? If you build it, they will come. You know, the wooden, the runway with the wooden plane, then the planes with the cargo will come up. Uh, there's a lot of really good research on the Papua New Guinean cargo cults of the uh, post-World War II, just before and after World War II. A, a nice example of this. There's no intuitive sense of where cargo comes from uh, in a modern world it, from our evolutionary history. So when did all this begin? Um, this is a slide I've used in my uh, evolution of, of, of our moral sentiments that, roughly speaking, this is one of these back of the envelope, orders of magnitude type uh, sequences that roughly, let's say our species is about 100,000 years old, in which most of that time we lived in small bands of tens to hundreds of individuals uh, and then shifted to tribes, chiefdom states, and, and today empires. Um, so the whole notion of states, uh, religion and really mo modern markets and, and economics comes about when tribes, bands and tribes begin to coalesce into chiefdoms and states. Before chiefdoms and states and huge populations, you don't really need codified rules of how we should get along. You don't need Ten Commandments and codes of Hammurabi and government decrees and whatnot. It, most of these issues are resolved by uh, tribal leaders, bands, a small group, uh, uh, informal means of behavior control, shunning, things like that. We have built in natural ways to control behavior as long as the populations are small and people know each other. In large, huge societies, it's too easy to hide and, and get away. So you need more formal rules, <clears throat> unless you're really famous like OJ who can't get a golf game in LA anymore, so he moved to Florida. But it's the same kind of shunning effect. In this evolutionary economic transition, there's a shift from the equal distribution of economic wealth among bands to the emergence of hierarchical wealth as a token of status and power among tribes. Egalitarianism, or at least the pretense of it, falls apart as bands and tribes coalesce into chiefdoms and states. And we end up with this paradox that arises when there's this tension between our selfish desire to gain greater wealth and our social desire for equality, or at least that no one should be inordinately unequal, either too rich or too poor. In monstrously large modern states, we have both abject poverty and unimaginable wealth, both of which cause considerable consternation. Typically, this translates into political policy to raise the poor and lower the rich. The entire assumption is based on the idea, the, intuitively, the intuitive notion that makes sense, that the, it's a win-lose game. It's a sum zero. If somebody gets something in the natural environment, somebody else is not getting it because there was so much limitation on wealth. I like this, cart this editorial cartoon from the New Yorker. I hated Bill Gates beca before it became so fashionable. <laughs> there is a resentment against super achievers like that in, in our culture, always has been. I think, it, and I've long thought about that, trying to figure out is this something we've just learned? Is this just, you know, those liberals doing this? That kind of thing, which is what libertarians like to say about their critics. <laughs> um, but, but no, I think it is deeper. I think it goes against the grain. Uh, of how, we, of how we made this transition. So the problem I want to solve in the next book, the, the, the big problem, um, is how we made the transition from hunter-gatherers to consumer traders. So let's do a quick comparison, back of the envelope calculation, between the Yanomamo hunter-gatherers of Brazil and Venezuela and the Manhattan consumer traders of, you know, that, that, that place east of New Jersey. Uh, it's been estimated that the average annual income of the Yamamano people is $90 per person per year. Obviously, they don't have cash, but so it's roughly translated. Uh, that's a, uh, and that the annual average income of Manhattanites is an average of 36000 per person per year. That's for the entire 8 million, right? I mean, there's plenty of people that make a lot more. The mode would probably be shifted up quite a bit. But let's use the, the mean, and, and that's a, a difference of 400 times. Even more shocking is if you, if you count, uh, it's a retail measure, stock keeping units, SKUs, a retail measure of the number of different product types available to a group. It's roughly 300 for the Yanomamo people, roughly 10 billion 
for the Manhattanites. That's a difference of 33 million times. 